All right, hello everyone, welcome to lecture 13. Today's topic is distributed NoSQL databases. Now last time we talked about push notifications, which are, is a way to um, uh, design architectures that are not purely client server. So, so far everything we've talked about has had um, clients making requests to servers, servers giving responses. There are many cases when a server actually wants to push data out to a client without the client having to ask for it first. Often that's because you have one user do something and that affects another user. Like you create a message, you need to deliver it to another user. Um, this is a challenge because of the way the internet is built and, and the way um, uh, specifically with NATs and, and uh, networking, the fact that client devices are not all, on all the time, all that kind of stuff makes it a challenge. Mobile OSs have a specific pro solution to this called push notification services, which are managed by the operating system provider. These allow for the client to have a single connection to the cloud, to that push notification service that's shared by all the apps on the phone that might be getting notifications. It means for you as a service developer, you have to send your notifications through that third party notification service. There also is a similar solution for, uh, for applications in general, like desktop applications or web-based applications. Uh, uh, WebSockets or long polling is the older version of that where the browser tab has a long lived connection to the cloud. There um, you might have your own um, that uh, push notification microservice that manages uh, routing messages to the clients. Okay. Now, now since we're going to be talking about NoSQL databases, I want to review uh, what we covered in lecture nine a few a few lectures ago on scaling SQL databases because we're going to see how that we're going to continue that topic of scaling databases now uh, to a greater extent. Okay. So in that lecture nine, we talked about read replicas as being a way to horizontally scale databases for re reading, and we talked about sharding as a way to partition the data so that it so you have more, more than one relational database that is each one is storing has the capability to store uh, rows for all the tables but you divide the rows using some sharding rule um, for example you might have all the data for users in a particular geographic region on one server and a different different geographic region on another server um, those are kind of they're functionally equivalent but they're storing a subset of the data so you're partitioning the data now um, yeah, by doing this, we are able to accept writes on more than one machine uh, kind of concurrently so we can scale up the system to handle more writes. But the downside of this approach was that partitioning data was difficult to do and it had to be done manually. You need some kind of a sharding rule to decide how to sp split up your data. Um, this can work well. The performance is good if the queries you execute can be executed within a single shard. So in other words, you're joining data from rows from multiple tables, and those rows are coming from the same machine, so there doesn't have to be communication from the outside world. We assume that that network-based communication is, is much slower than uh, just grabbing data from, from uh, disk or memory in a single machine. Yeah. When we have normalized data, which is to say we're using a relational model with m more than one table, we have references where rows in one table refer to rows in another table. It's difficult to divide that into partitions in such a way that there's not a lot of communication between the nodes. So what we'll see today, this is kind of giving you a preview of the lecture. What NoSQL databases do is denormalize the data to solve that problem. In other words, they avoid having references and instead, in many cases, duplicate data uh, because it um, allows you to have a copy of data that you need in one place to, to fulfill a request by just contacting one or a small number of, of nodes rather than, than getting the data from the one place where it exists. Okay. So as a review, um, with normalized data, we have, we have more than one table. We have rows that refer to other rows with foreign keys. Uh, so for example, we ha this is the uh, scheme, this example schema for LinkedIn. We had a user whose industry, in, in the entry for the user, the industry is, is summarized by just a short reference, this industry ID 131 which points to a row, row number 131 in the industries table that has a lot more information about that industry. And this, the reason why we have this reference is because uh, this philanthropy industry is, is associated with many different users and there might be a lot of information associated with that uh, industry. We don't want to have to repeat it for every single user that's in that industry, yet we want it to be linked to uh, all those users. Okay, so this allows for an efficient way to store data it allows us to avoid duplicating data so that we can edit it in one place. Like if we wanted to change the spelling of philanthropy to be, you know, uh, to, to, 
like if we wanted to change it from philanthropy to philanthropy and charity that description could change and we can change it in one place and that change would apply to all the users who are in that industry so that's a that's a good feature in some sense yeah but well what i want to show you here is that um those those relationships those uh links those foreign keys um make partitioning difficult because it means that we, that we have data that's associated with a single related data um, has to be split among the partitions. We want we want data that is um, the li that's closely related to be in the same place rather than two different places. What I'm showing uh, in this picture here is a graph representation of the rows in a database. So um, the nodes, these blue dots, these represent rows. Okay, so bear with me here. That the dots represent rows, and the edges represent um, references. So the re edges represent foreign keys. Okay. So we have a lot of rows in the in the database. So rows refer to refer to other rows, and those create links in this graph. So it's a really it sh this graph shows a relationship between data rows in the database. If we want to divide the, the data rows into different partitions and we want to make it our system efficient, then when there are linkages between data, we want that data to be on the same partition if possible. So that when we do end up doing a query that has to connect to, to follow a reference to connect those two data, um, it doesn't have to it only has to contact one machine instead of two machines. So to solve this problem, one way to look at it is to consider this graph and to try to come up with an optimal partitioning of the graph. When I say a partitioning, I mean dividing the edges, I mean the nodes into two uh, subsets, two disjoint subsets that completely cover all the nodes, where where the number of edges that cross between the partitions is minimal. Okay, When we have an edge crossing a partition, that means we have a row in one partition that refers to data in the other in the other partition. So like these two edges should reflect the fact that this row points to these rows. It's okay that these edges point to other nodes within the same partition because that would be a, a cheap lookup to do. If you want to um, find, if you're looking up this data and you want to also find the, the linked data, um, finding these ones is easy, but, but getting the data from these ones is hard because it involves making a request to another partition. Okay, We want to involve as few partitions as possible in our queries so that we, 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 ha we achieve scale, right? We, we want to be able to, if we have n nodes, handle n times as many queries as if we had just one node. That means that every query needs to be um, restricted to just one node, ideally, or a small number of nodes. All right, so the, this is the graph partitioning problem. We want to arrange these, split these nodes into two partitions such that the number of crossings is minimized. And we want these part, this partitioning to be balanced, right? Because if we put all the part, all the nodes in one partition and none in the other, that we haven't actually partitioned it, and we're doing all the work on one machine and we're not doing any work on the other machine. Okay, so that's not good either. So it needs to be a balanced partition. Okay. So um, it's nice that we have a model for this, but um, solving this problem well is difficult. This is actually an NP complete problem. Okay, well, the fact that it's NP-complete doesn't necessarily mean that it's intractable. We can approximately solve this problem fairly well with um, heuristic algorithms. But um, this cost function is a little bit simplistic, so the modeling we did is not totally accurate. So um, in this model, we're giving every edge the same weight, but some references are more important than other words. In other words, some and some nodes are more important than others. So some nodes will be fetched more frequently, some references will be followed more frequently, and uh, the partitioning problem should reflect that. So you could try to weight the nodes or the edges to, to fix that. That makes it more complicated. Um, but in general, the problem here is that we can, we're always going to have some crossings, and those crossings are always going to have a cost because it involves doing a join that, that, that uh, involves more than one data partition in, in the query. Okay. So, you know. Yeah, and again, this the the these edges represent the need to transfer data between nodes, between between partitions, or or to get data from more than one partition when we're doing a query that involves related data. Okay, so how do you think the structure of this this data, the structure of the data, and therefore the structure of this graph, 
affect the solution quality. So what would be an example? Can you think of any examples of situations where you would have an easy partitioning versus a hard partitioning? How does that relate to um, different kinds of data models, I guess, or data that is modeled? Stop and think about that, see what you come up with. Well, um, there are a few things we can notice. So random interconnections are bad. If we have a random graph, it's actually going to be impossible to um, partition it in a way that has uh, a small number of partitions. But uh, well-structured data with simple relationships is good. So if we have like two subsets of the graph, like two subgraphs that are highly connected, but they have few relationships between them, that makes them easy to partition. Or ideally, we, we could have two totally disjoint subgraphs. Those would be easy to partition, right? No edges between. So if our data has relationships that 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 are uh, localized to to one subset and and that, that um, uh, recursively or transitively are are localized to one partition, that's a good thing. But if if they connect to random other places, that's bad. Okay. If we have nodes with high degree, a lot of edges, a lot of references, that's a bad thing because it becomes harder to place them in one partition. Like for example, this node here that has one, two, three, four, five, six neighbors. Um, if we want to have a perfect solution, then all six of its neighbors have to be in one partition. That creates a lot of constraints. Whereas a node that has just one neighbor um, can be very easily placed in uh, the same partition as its neighbor, okay, without imposing any additional constraints on the system. Okay, so I'm, I've, I've still been talking about SQL relational databases and um, what the problem we're solving when, when sharding. When we shard a relational database we're, or, or partition it, we want to do it in such a way that the references between the partitions are minimized. What NoSQL databases do is minim <laughs> eliminate, make this problem really easy by eliminating references. So in, the, in this bottom graph, I'm, I have the same picture, but I'm eliminating any references. And I also made the dots bigger because what I've done is I'm storing more data. Instead of having references to data in other rows, in other tables, I'm, store, I'm making copies of that data when it's referenced in the uh, nodes that, that refer to it. Okay, that, makes, that, that gives us more data to store, so it's inefficient, but it makes partitioning easy because you never have references to other to data that, that are in, that's in other partitions. So that you can think of this at a high level as what NoSQL databases do. That when we do that, when we remove the ability to create references, we no longer have um, the ability to do joins. We no longer have I can use the SQL language, and we no longer have normalized data. So we have inefficiency in the storage, and uh, we call this denormalized data. We have copies of reference data, and I'll, I'll have some slides that show you what that means. But the plus side of it is that we're making a choice that makes it really easy to partition the data, such that we can access data um, using only one partition. If we want this blue nodes data, we get it here. We don't have to fetch data from any other node, which means in particular, we don't have to touch this other partition because uh, all the data related to this entity, related to this row is in one place. Okay. So if you want to take a normalized data model like this LinkedIn uh, user and store it in a denormalized way in a NoSQL database, we just follow all the references and fill in the values. So what I've done here is actually built out a JSON dictionary that stores the same data. So at first we see the um, values that were in this user row. Then after that we have some of these other values that previously were stored as many to one relationships with foreign keys. Like for example the positions down here that were in a different table that referred to the same user. We had two of them in this case. Instead we're storing them as a, as a list down here. Okay, that's okay. Education down here, same thing. Notice also that the industry philanthropy, which previously was stored as a numeric ID that referred to another table, that is denormalized. So the philanthropy word is pulled in and actually stored directly rather than by, as a reference. The region is stored directly as the all the information about the region that we have is stored here in the user rather than having a reference to somewhere else where we look up that region information. This is kind of a simple example because we just have a string, but in general, you know, the region could have a lot of information, like what's the population of the region, what's the geography, latitude, and longitude. Um, imagine, if you imagine that, then we would be copying all that population, latitude, and longitude information in here into the information under Bill Gates, and that is data that would be duplicated 
for all the users that were in the greater Seattle area, right? So for um, hundreds of thousands of um, potentially LinkedIn users. Okay, and we have instead of instead of lots of rows and lots of columns, we have one row <laughs> with two columns essentially. The first one is just a key, and the second one is a value. So we'll see that NoSQL databases are key value stores, uh, which is to say they're just kind of dictionaries that map from a key to a value. The value stores a lot of data that's denormalized, um, often represented as JSON, but it, you know it could be in other formats. And this user ID here, two fifty one. Is the it was previously um, a primary key in one of the tables. Now this is the only key we have. If we want to look something up, we need to use a user ID key to find it. Okay. All right. So why are we doing this? <laughs> why do we have just one column? We went from a very complex or a very rich modeling system, uh, the SQL relational databases, to something that's a lot more stripped down and simple where we just kind of like have a big text field where we can hack in whatever we want. Okay, Why do we do this? What's the benefit of doing this? Why have just one um, one column value and, and one key? Well, if you have just one key, the benefit is that um, you can define the location in terms of the partition. You can use this to, to as the the sharding key essentially to figure out what partition to store the data to know where to find the data and so you use this as an index um, uh, we also by by having just one value and not having a schema that you define ahead of time we can store anything we want in here and it, and what we store here can change and be different for each user so for example some users may have two part two positions in their history others may have no positions Others may have ten different positions. This, the fact that we're just storing a blob of text here, means we can we have a lot of flexibility in in storing many to one relationships uh, of any number. And uh, we have just one table, in addition to having just one key and one value in in that table, because uh, we don't have references, so there's really no point in having more than one table. We we could technically have some we could technically have an ID in here that referred to another row like we have user ID four 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 here is another user uh, Steve that you could say that Bill Gates um, you could have a list here of like let's say followers or friends and and this this user ID could be listed there um, and that would refer to another row but there's there's no real point in putting that in another table because um, there's no schema in this table anyway so it's just a, a key and a value the value can be anything. I don't know if that makes sense. Okay, so these NoSQL databases are key value stores and they use hashing as, for data partitioning. I'm just going to do a quick review of hashing, and I'm sure all of you have seen this, but just bear with me because um, we're going to see how this um, is like the fundamental thing that, that enables this to be scalable and, and easy to implement. A as you recall, a hash is an algorithm that takes a value and return tr translates it into a pseudo random value that's derived from it. So it's not random, and it, it's not truly random. It's deterministic, and so um, it'll always be the same. For a given input, it'll produce the same output, but it's kind of unpredictable based on looking at, at the input. An example of a hash is MD5. SHA-1 is another one. Um, and the way hashes are implemented is there's a long sequence of arithmetic operations, typically, that you can apply to generate some like random-looking output. So here, here's some different inputs that you might apply to a hashing algorithm. And get you get different outputs. Notice that I have first I have Steve, then I have Steve with a lowercase s. So just a slight difference in the input leads to a totally different output. Okay. Notice also that all the outputs are the same length. I'm expressing them as um, in, in hex to represent the the bits of the uh, of the hash. Um, the input could be a bit different length. It doesn't matter. For example, this last one, Tale of Two Cities, is a really long, 800,000 character um, story. And that maps to this hash value. Okay, the, the hash function is designed to take a input of any length. And when I repeat the same input, like I put in Steve with a capital S twice, the second time I enter it, I'll get the exact same output. Right. Another convenient thing is that the output is in a fixed range, so they're all this number of characters. Regardless of how big the input is, it'll give an output of the same length. 
Okay, so it kind of gives you an, a value in a, in a certain range that, that's predefined. A hash table uses a hash of a key to determine the storage location um, for a value. Okay, and it it's implements the abstract data type called a dictionary or map. And if, you know, if you're using the Python language, dictionaries, for example, dictionaries are kind of a built-in thing, or in, in JavaScript, objects are kind of the same thing. Um, so um, we use the word dictionary because uh, you know a, a language dictionary maps from a word to a definition of the word, and we're kind of doing the same thing with um, the data type dictionary. We have a key, which is the thing we're looking up, and the value is the, the longer thing associated with it. Um, we can think of a, a table in a database as a hash table if we um, use the primary key as a hash and the list of, of column values as the uh, value. And we could store that as a list of, um, you know, as a list in, in, for example, a JSON list here is what I'm showing. Okay. Now, the mechanics of a simple hash table, which you've probably seen, is that you take the key, you hash it, that gives you a number, and that number determines where to store it in some array. Okay, in the array, so the index in the array where you store the data depends on the hashed value of the key. The only complication here is that when there could be collisions, right? Because you're, you're, the storage you have is like a fixed and, and relatively small size to match the size of the data. When there's a collision, you have two things that map to this hash to the same value. In that case, you have to have some rule for finding an open slot. For example, linear probings, where you just like go to the next available slot, see if that's available. So we're gonna use the same scheme now to build a scalable NoSQL database. Um, before we get there, you know, this is, it's also worth mentioning that you can use hashes as indexes in SQL uh, database tables. For In the lecture eight or, or so, I, I showed that if you're storing uh, a database table, you would often have a tree-based index also stored that allows you to quickly find those rows. And another way to implement that in index would be as a hash table. And the value of the hash table would be the location in memory or disk or storage in general of where you'd find the rest of the um, row. The only downside of a hash-based index is that it doesn't provide uh, a way to easily scan through ranges of values. Rather, it allows you to, because of like the random positioning of each value, it allows you to quickly find where a given um, row is, but not, uh, not a quick way to find all the rows whose keys are between certain um, ranges, whereas a, a tree-based index lets you do that. But that's kind of a digression. The main thing I want to show here is how you go from a hash table to a distributed hash table, which a turn, in turn is essentially a NoSQL database. So what we do is we take our hash table abstractly and we break it into partitions. We have a bunch of nodes that are going to store the data and each node is pre-assigned a partition of the key space that it will store. So if we break it into three chunks, node one might store hash values between zero and <coughs> between zero and three 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 node 2 between 333 and 665, and node 3 between 666 and 999. That covers the whole hash space. So um, if you want to store data now in this distributed hash table, you still compute the hash of your key, but then the value you get determines not just like an array position in memory, but it where it falls in the range, in the ranges that, that are assigned to the nodes, determines which node you hand it to. And of course, when that node gets the, the uh, key and value, it will it can hash that to, to, figure, to figure out where within its current storage to put that value. But the main thing is, um, at this stage, that it determines which of the nodes it's stored in. Okay, So the client can compute that ahead of time and use that to determine which node to go to. All right, so distributed hash tables are, um, are the essence of NoSQL databases. So a NoSQL database is like a big distributed key value store, like I showed. And the reason why we, like, one of the benefits, I think, of simplifying the schema and not having references and stuff like that is it allows us to use the simple distributed hash table implementation that's very scalable, as we'll see. So the, you don't have, um, you can't support SQL queries like you, you get with a traditional relational database. Instead, you just get this dictionary abstract data type where you can, 
get the value for a key or you can put a value for a key or you can check to see whether a key it has been stored, right? The beauty of this and the reason why it's scalable is because the client can run the hash function on its own without contacting anyone and based on the result of that hash it can determine which of the nodes it needs to send its request to. So it can go directly to the appropriate request. There is no central bottleneck at all, right? If we just if we have a hundred nodes um, we can store a hundred times as much data and we can have a hundred times as many clients working. Each of those clients if it I mean the clients actually have to be told what all the nodes are and what hash ranges they're responsible for. That's not a big deal for, for uh, reasonably sized NoSQL databases. Once they have, their, they have that information, they can do the computation of, of the hash and figure out which, which um, partition they need to send the request to and just send it directly there. So that's a very scalable design. Only one node is involved in each query. right? If we wanted to support SQL with joins, um, that would involve maybe um, doing this hash to get data from one table and then doing another hash to get uh, a row that's referred to from foreign key in another uh, partition and so on, uh, which is possible, but it's not um, its not really efficient. It involves a lot of round trips through the data. So I want you to stop and think about what might limit the scalability of a NoSQL database implemented on a distributed hash table based on what I've said so far. So I said that it can it can grow larger without slowing down, but at what point does it start to would it start to slow down? There's actually a, a little subtle point here that maybe you can think of. Well, I said before the key there was an assumption that the client needs the clients need to know what all the nodes are in the distributed hash table and what ranges they're responsible for. Once that grows large, once your system grows really huge, like if you have millions of nodes in your distributed hash table, they're going to be coming and going frequently and they're going to be have to reassign their hash ranges to different nodes. So you end up having a really difficult distributed consensus problem to decide, um, to agree upon for everyone to know and have an up-to-date list of what all the nodes are in the distributed hash table and what ranges are, they're, they're assigned to. Okay. But for reasonably small sizes, like in the hundreds, that's not a huge, uh, really difficult. That's not too difficult a problem to solve. And we can store a lot of data with hundreds of nodes. Okay. So what we get then uh, is a distributed shared nothing architecture. I call this shared nothing architecture because they're not sharing data, and requests can go to just one node. Like the data is the data is assigned to one home. We get a cluster of machines. You can connect them up on a network. I'm just showing a network switch here to show that they're all connected together. Every node has a, fractor, a fraction of the um, data set. And, and that's, that's it, right, at, at a very simple level. We'll talk about more details next lecture about consistency and replication and whatnot. But this idea of a distributed hash table is actually pretty powerful and gives you a good mental model for what's happening and give, gives you a good understanding of why it's scalable. Examples of these kinds of distributed databases that use like hash-based partitioning are Mongo, Cassandra, Am and Amazon's DynamoDB. DynamoDB, um, about I want to say 15 to 20 years ago, um, they published a paper that kind of um, described this idea and that kind of like um, and, that, and then Cassandra is an example of a open-source implementation that follows that design. Okay, and in addition to NoSQL databases, I think you'll you'll find also that distributed file systems use the same basic idea. Like Amazon's S3, is a, they, they describe it as an object store, but basically it's the same thing, same idea because what a distributed hash table stores has a key and it stores a big value or a value that could be big. If we think of the key as a file name with the full path of the file and the value as the file contents, then the same architecture can be used to store um, to handle an, an S3 bucket uh, storage or any other kind of distributed file system, most other kinds of distributed file systems, although some might have more complex metadata needs. But for a simple distributed file system like Amazon S3, this design uh, works well. Okay, so the plus side is scalability, but what are the downsides of NoSQL? Okay, we're gonna have a, a few lectures talking about this, um, or at least one other, two, at least two others, uh, to some degree to talk about this. but. What I'm showing you here is the is the denormalized data for this LinkedIn user, the way it's stored. It's kind of like a big blob of data, all the, the data associated with the user. 
Um, okay, so one of the downsides is that we have just one indexed column, which is the key. So if we want to find all of the people that work at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for example, Bill and Melinda Gates is a value that appears here within the, the value. It's not indexed. The only thing that's indexed is the user ID. So if I want to find, I would have to scan through all the values and kind of search through to look for that, that, that value. Uh, only this key is, is what is hashed to give me a quick um, lookup of the location of the data. Okay. Now, there's some hacks to get around that kind of, where you could add another row. Basically, if, if, if it was important to list all the employees of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, you could have another row that had a key that was Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and then the values would be that list, a list of IDs, and then those would be things that you could run through the hash function to look up those rows as well. So you, you could implement kind of a pseudo join that way, but it's inefficient because it involves a lot of queries, and those queries are going to end up going to different machines. Another problem with this design with denormalization in general is that we have duplication of data. So for example, Greater Seattle Area, Philanthropy, Organization, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, these are all things that are associated with many users and have to be repeated for all the users. If we wanted to change any of these, um, for example, if the company name changes, uh, in a relational design, you can just have a reference to a company, and then everyone who's point points to that would be able to see the change in the company name or the company logo or any other information about the company. If it's denormalized in a NoSQL database and copied out to all the, the users associated with that, that data, then you have to go through and change all those users, right? So every time, for example, the company name appears, you'd have to change it, or the same thing for the region and industry, which previously were foreign keys. Um, and there could be wasted space because like this region, for example, like I said earlier on, there could be a lot of information about the region. If you want to make that available in a denormalized design like this, you'd have to list it all out here. You know, population, area, latitude, longitude. Um, that could be in one place in a relational database that point, that's pointed to with a, with a numeric ID with a foreign key that you'd be able to modify in one place. You'd say you'd only store it in one place so you wouldn't waste uh, storage and you'd, you'd um, wouldn't have the possibility of uh, data being out of sync where it's edited in one place but not in the other. We still have the, we have the possibility of references through a sort of hacky um, uh, listing of keys that they have other rows for, but there's no constraint checking done, so that's a problem. Whereas, I mean, we haven't really gone into this, but with relational databases, when you have foreign keys, um, for example, if the industry ID points to another table um, that stores the industries, you can actually have the database require that the that the linkage is actually valid. You don't have a pointer that is like dangling the point that points to nothing, or points to an invalid old entry. If you're implementing this yourself by hacking it, you wouldn't have that constraint check, and you, the database generally doesn't implement that because that adds a lot of inefficiency. Again, you end up involving a lot of nodes every time you make a change on one of the nodes. So, so that's why this design avoids um, enforcing those reference those kinds of references by default. Okay, so here's an example where we try to have our cake and eat it too. So we try to use a NoSQL database for its scalability, right? This distributed hash table design, but we try to normalize the data. So in other words, we take the user, right? And we, st we store references for these values instead of um, storing all the details. So for example, we have region ID is US colon 91. Down, if we can use that as a key in, the, in this uh, data store to look up uh, the, in, the detailed information about that region. And that would allow more than one user to point to this re same data element, right? So that's a way of normalizing the data, still staying within the constraints of this dictionary um, abstract data type. So I want to ask, is this possible? And why don't we do this? Let's stop and think about that. So yes, it is possible. Um, why wouldn't we do it? I, I gave some of the reasons before, but to uh, restate them, mainly it's for performance. Um, and also for uh, the enforcement of these constraints. Like if we need to get all the the information for Bill Gates, now we have to fetch this key, right? That, that'll go to one machine, we, or we get this. We get that back, we look up these, these IDs, and then we do additional queries. Those queries have to be... 
sent to other nodes that are storing these other rows. Because remember, the location of these rows is going to be based on a hashing of the keys. If we want to do something more clever, then we're back to the um, original problem of sharding a relational database in an optimal way where you have that graph partitioning problem. Okay. So you'd have to do a lot of serial queries one after another to fetch all the different pieces of data needed to put it together to um, get this user information. Again, and also if you, the, the way, because the database is designed to be uh, sharded with hashing, to be, to be, uh, to distribute the data using, using hashing, it doesn't enforce uh, foreign key constraints. So for example, if you were to delete this position here, number 458, that wouldn't, it wouldn't know, um, it wouldn't go back and, and change this one to remove the 458 from the list of positions, so you would still think that you had two positions unless you had application code that manually did that. Okay. All right, so to summarize this topic from today, we started off talking about data partitioning, so specifically with um, relational databases where we have rows that are linked to others with foreign keys. Um, to, to shard really well, we want to we want to divide the data so that the right load is balanced and so that we minimize the number of partitions that are involved in a query. We do that by treating the rows as a graph with the nodes in a graph and the edges as relationships between the rows, which are foreign keys. We try to um, solve a minimal cost balanced graph partitioning problem. Um, so SQL sharding is a that uh, is a special case of this where you have application code that decides that rule for partitioning, but in general we looked at a way of looking at this theoretically to try to come up with an optimal solution to this graph partitioning. NoSQL databases, um, and, and that, you know, that's valid, data partitioning is, is an active area of database research and it's something that um, you, can, you can go down that path and, and try to keep the links between normalized data and just try to partition it as well as possible. But NoSQL databases take a different approach where they eliminate references they denormalize data by making copies of the data that was previously referenced in the relational design. And so we can partition data without worrying about having to check more than one database node when we're accessing a given um, entry. So we call that denormalization. This ends up consuming more, more space because we're duplicating data and it allows data to become inconsistent perhaps because we have duplicates of the data in multiple places, but that we kind of live with that in, in NoSQL world. Uh, because uh, it allows the design of the database to be simple, which allows for it to be scalable. These databases are really scalable, NoSQL databases, uh, when they provide just a key value abstraction with one key that's indexed, because you can use that one key to, uh, with a hash function to determine what the, the home is for every row. So you do uh, hash-based partitioning of the data to implement a NoSQL database, uh, which allows you to balance the load, of, of both the storage and also the um, accesses in a really easy way that's that can be applied to any application as long as with your application you can map your data into this key value abstraction in other words to, to if a big high scale uh, dictionary is good enough for you then you can use a NoSQL database uh, to store data now we'll see later on in a couple lectures that NoSQL databases generally provide more than just the key value abstraction. They each, which is why there's so many of them, because they all provide a little bit of extra functionality in addition to the basic um, distributed hash table. Uh, but that's that's the basis you should keep in mind. The, the basic model you should have for a, a NoSQL database. Now, keep in mind also that the, the reason this is efficient is because each client, independently in parallel without involving anyone else, can on its own compute the hash of a key and use its own copy of a list of nodes and what hash ranges they're responsible for to decide where to send the request and therefore can can um, you can have a large amount of load that's distributed with like almost infinite scale except to the extent that where you run into um, problems getting all the clients to get the most up and up-to-date and consistent list of nodes that are in the uh, distributed hash table. Alright, hope that made sense. Uh, see you next time.